Thank you. Um, so wonderful to be here and so many inspiring ideas today. Uh, Sally mentioned we don't think about cities very often. I think about cities every moment of every day. And at Neighbourlytics, we're a social analytics platform for neighbourhoods. We create big data for cities, but we our proprietary technology specifically looks at people and behavioural data. And that's used by property developers to help understand what to build where and by governments to help optimise for economic development. But when we look across our database, we also get really unique insights into how we live and how we work. And particularly around trends, around the future of living and the future of work, which are many of the questions that we are grappling with every day. If you Google the future of living, you're probably going to get an image that's something like this. It's very easy for us to imagine a future that's highly optimised and sustainable. But it, this picture is missing one critical thing. Can anyone tell me what it is? People, right. Unfortunately, people are complex and messy and difficult to understand. And when we look at the reality of how we are coping with population growth around the world, our cities are likely to look much less like this and much more like this. Now, one of the challenges here is that cities are not only physical ecosystems to be optimised, they are human systems. And as Michaela mentioned, I came across some research 10 years ago by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation in the US, which really shocked me. And that's that your postcode is as likely to affect your life expectancy as your genetic code. We've talked a lot about health today, but one of the, the big drivers of our health is actually the neighbourhood that we live in. When we really looked at this problem, one of the challenges that city makers, governments, property developers have is when they're making decisions about what to build where, almost all of the information that gets used to make that decision is about the physical environment, like building heights, the width of the road. But you and I all know that what makes a neighbourhood great to live in, what attracts the best retail, what creates the best prices and return on investment isn't how tall the building is, but rather the culture, the behaviour, the lifestyle. So at Neighbourlytics, we solve that human data gap by tapping into unique big data, anonymised and aggregated mobile phone location information, public social media, ratings and reviews, check-ins and likes to help understand the dynamics of cities and spaces. This helps us understand key questions that we need to make decisions, such as where visitors come from, where people spend time, what the amenity mix, what the shops or other retail should be, and what people care about. By understanding these questions, we can deliver up to four times greater visitor attraction. If we look at somewhere like where we are today in Redfern, we can see it has a physical environment that we can see and experience, perhaps get lost in but it also has a social environment. We can see where people spend time, what people value, the most popular places, perhaps what's missing and what we need to optimise for moving forward. We've been able to look at this kind of information for more than 2,000 locations across more than 12 countries, working now with 80% of tier one developers across Australia. And what this gives us a window into is really important information about the future of living, the future of work, the future of retail, and these core trends that are emerging. So if we look at just three of these briefly, when it comes to the future of living, we're living in a housing crisis. You don't have to look very far to understand that the rental prices are increasing, mortgage rates are increasing. But we need to deliver more than housing if we're going to go anywhere close to solving this problem. Not only because people actually want amenity, they want shops and opportunities, but also because that has a fundamental impact on our well-being as well. What we're, one of the things that we're able to look at uh, is how far people are willing to travel from their suburbs. And we've all been through a pretty big lifestyle shift in the past few years with COVID. That the big shift that we've seen is rather than living and traveling around our cities every day, we are living hyper-locally. Most of us now won't leave our neighborhood very often. But there are some neighborhoods where you're likely to not leave at all. Places like Bondi, <laughs> And Turak and Armadale, if you're from Melbourne, these are the places where people travel the least distance. So they're happy to stay. They're extra hyper-local. 
but that hyperlocal living refocuses the what we actually need to be building. So we've been doing some work with a property developer up in Townsville, and this would look like a residential suburb for all looks and feels. But when we look at the digital data behind it, what we're actually seeing is not just people working from home, but this is a huge density of home-based businesses, that there are trades, there are beauty stores, there are people running Etsy um, stores from their garage. This is actually a business precinct, but it's not designed as such. So the future of living is actually less likely to be high-density apartments, more like neighbourhoods like this, but these are also now multifunctional work environments. The second is the future of work. And cities around the world are vying for talent and investment. It's now a competitive global market where you can work, live and work technically anywhere. What is going to attract people to want to live in this particular city? Now, in the past, that's all been about having the big brand. You want to live in London for finance. Perhaps you want a view of the Sydney Harbour Bridge like this. But having major anchor tenants, major anchor tenants or major big cities is no longer what's actually driving people to live and move. It's all about the lifestyle mix. Working recently on a commercial real estate development in central Melbourne, one of the things that we found is that people are really only interested to experience what's in a 10-minute walk around their office building when it comes to amenity. Very, very hyper-local. And whether you're in a remote work camp or a return to work camp, I won't judge you, but I'm assuming that most of us are probably in that the future of work is very much in some kind of hybrid or remote um, model. But there are many people who are interested to think about strategies for attracting talent, strategies for attracting people back to the office. And what the data shows is that it's not actually about your workplace at all. It's about the level of amenity that you're able to offer within a five or ten minute walk from that office building is does this precinct offer the lifestyle that your employees will want? Now, what urban research shows us is something called the power of ten that says that you need to have ten or more re reasons to visit a place. If you think of a place that you like to spend time, perhaps your favourite cafe, park where you walk your dog, you could probably find 10 or more reasons that you might want to be there. You know, the playground, sitting down, listening to music, seeing friends. When it comes to creating great workplaces, you need 10 or more reasons to visit. So work is one. Perhaps the cafe on the ground floor is two. That means finding eight more amenities within the city block that's actually going to attract people back to the office. The second is the future of retail. Perhaps one of the industries that's been most disrupted by digitisation and digital transformation. And COVID has definitely accelerated this where we're leaving the house much less for essential services like groceries and medical. But we are still actually leaving the house amazingly. And we're all here today as testament for that. But it's not to go to a major brand store if we're talking about retail. The reasons that people will leave is much more around social connection. This is a lot of lines on a chart for like three o'clock in the afternoon, but I figure you're deep tech people and you can probably handle it. But what we're looking at here is the total volume of activity at Chadston Shopping Centre, the largest shopping centre in the Southern Hemisphere, and the different lines of the different types of activity. So whether that relates to hospitality, retail, health and wellbeing. And it'll be difficult to see on this, but what we've actually seen is that after COVID, there's really been that the retail hasn't really increased at all. So people are still visiting, but they're visiting for the cinema, for the cafe, to visit friends, to perhaps, you know, attend uh, manicure or other beauty. It's not about essential retail. So the whole repurposing and reframing of this is a shopping centre, but it could be main streets or other activity centres, which are very much the heartbeat and lifeblood of our neighbourhoods, is shifting. And so when it comes to planning and designing for the future of cities, it's much less around where am I going to shop, because this is infrastructure that is actually moving into a whole different kind of logistics framework, but more about where are those opportunities for social connection so almost every city in the world has really great mechanisms for measuring itself in terms of its physical environment, and we've got really good at that. But our big blind spot is understanding the people and the social life. This is actually what improves our well-being, but it's also what actually drives the ROI when it comes to things like optimising for retail, housing, and the future of work. 
So the future of living, the future of cities, isn't necessarily this big complex world that we think it might be. It actually comes down to the everyday human connections and the future is human. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I always love your word, it's always great.